Okay, we're live. All right. Okay, everyone, I'm going to read the pre-meeting welcome. Thank you for joining us. This begins the pre-meeting for the July 8th, 2020 hearing of the Rochester Preservation Board. During the pre-meeting, staff and board members review cases. There is no participation by applicants or the public. Following the conclusion of the pre-meeting, a public hearing will be held at 6 p.m. Here, all cases will be heard, applicants will present, and public comment will be read into the record. After the conclusion of the hearing, deliberations will follow. The board will take action on cases that were heard at the public hearing. There is no participation by applicants or the public. I ask that all staff and board members mute their microphone at this time and keep themselves muted unless they're going to speak. Uh, I also just want to mention that um, we have 10 cases tonight and our pre-meeting is only an hour. So uh, we're going to have to leave some time because we do have to go through uh, a item that is listed as unlisted under seeker. Uh, that case is 232 Mill Street. Um, Tom, when would you like to do that? Do you think it would be better to do that in the beginning or we can do that at the end? At the end? To have the discussion on that. Question for Tom Worth. Tom, can you hear me? Chris, can you hear me? I can hear you. So um, I don't see Tom on the call anymore, but I do know that um, Seeker is conducted in the pre-meeting itself. No, I understand that. I wasn't sure if he wanted to do it, if it would be better to do it at the beginning of the pre-meeting or at the end uh, for time's sake. Um, I guess we'll just get started. Uh, and when Tom comes back in, we'll skip 232 and we'll do it at the end. Um, so let's just get right into this. Again, uh, if you have substantial questions uh, regarding it and in terms of confusion, bring up that information, but just for um, time, brevity is preferred. I uh, Actually, Kirsten, I know that you had a question before we got, get started. If you wanted to speak about that. Um. Chris, and I think your question was in regards to your participation in deliberations. Yeah, um, I was not at several of the original hearings. I'm asking, should I deliberate on the current cases tonight? Um, so let's, yeah, because originally you were going to yeah, because a couple days ago was when I, I emailed you that uh, Deborah would not be available. So you didn't have the benefit of hearing the cases previously. So you're going to have to recuse yourself for those cases. So I believe that's the first four cases, correct? Any of the okay. older okay. cases. Um, yeah, any of the new cases starting at case six, you can speak to because those are new cases but the previous ones you'll have to recuse yourself yeah chris i was just going to say five is an old case too but yep. i think you you yeah i caught myself thanks okay uh so let's get started with case one this was uh part of the three cases last month that uh were not uh didn't have proper public hearing. So it's coming back uh, for the deliberations and any further um, questions or comments that the board have. Any questions about this? Oh, sure. Nope. So case two, that was another one, 149 South Fitzhugh Street that is a return case as well. No questions about that one. Case three, 1100 Park Avenue. Case four, 240 Culver Road. This was a return one as well. It was held uh, for additional information. Questions, comments? 
No? Eight five. Four ninety eight West Main. None. Seven South Madison Park. Okay. Chris, did you? That was the one with the um, artist studio. Which one? I'm sorry. The South. The Madison Avenue. Or Madison Park. No, no that's that's the home with the two air conditioners sure. in the backyard. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Artist studio we just skipped over. That was four ninety eight West Main. Okay, that one I just wondered. Did he come back with any other drawings or? Oh yeah. Because. Yeah, were, the packet I had, Dave, had tons of drawings. Okay, all right. Yeah, he came back with quite a bit more. Uh, it looked like he created little models showing exactly what it would look like using cardboard boxes and painting on them. Okay. I, I must have missed that. Oh, okay, thanks. Case seven, forty eight King Street. This one you may have noticed, and just to make note of, uh, it, it was reviewed um, at a previous hearing for the signage, but it was only reviewed as a conceptual review item. So it was not, it was not anything that was going to be um, approved, but there were comments. I also included those in this package um, and referenced the comments from the uh, conceptual review of this several months ago. Um, but this is a, a new application. 232 Mill Street, which um, I will actually skip this one and we'll talk about that when we get through the others because there's some more information uh, that we have to discuss about that in terms of the environmental, which I did send in that email when I sent all the staff reports out. Um, case number nine, 729 to 733 Park Avenue and 1475 East Avenue. No questions. Okay. So um, Tom Worth, uh, or actually let, let's do this first. Does anyone have any questions outside of the uh, seeker review for 232 Mill Street? The Holly pumping station? Okay. So, um, Whenever there's an unlisted action, and I'll let Tom talk more about this, uh, but typically most of the applications that come to the preservation board are type two actions, um, meaning that they do not require any further review. And the, the review that I'm talking about is the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Any project that goes to a board has to be reviewed under that. Um, most of the projects that you deal with here are, uh, in, are uh, architectural reviews, and they don't typically um, encounter something that wouldn't be, that would require further review by the board. In this case, we have an unlisted action, meaning that uh, there's no determination that it, it will definitely have uh, environmental effect um, and there isn't anything, uh, it's not specifically listed as something that would be exempt, exempt from uh, that sort of thing. So I'll leave it to Tom to talk more about that. I just wanted to preface it with that. So Tom, if you want to go from for that item. Yeah, so um, you've re reviewed the application materials and the applicants also prepared a part one short environmental assessment form. And so your job tonight is, before we get down to de deciding whether to approve this project is determine whether this project has the potential to generate any significant adverse environmental effect. And so in the second last page of your materials, there is a, a part two uh, list of questions that I'd like to just run through with you um, to see whether you think there's any that uh, any 
categories of potential effect that are triggered here. And then uh, when we finish that list, it goes on to, to the last page. Uh, we'll determine whether there there is any significant effect. And if there isn't, then it's a negative declaration and we're done. So is everyone with me on the second last page? And, and this is all to determine whether we would, the city would be required to, or the applicant to complete an environmental assessment or an environmental information statement uh, before you make a determination on action. Um, it's pretty rare that we, we have those in the city. Um, it's a several months long process to, to do one. Uh, and so that's kind of the context of, of determining whether something's significant or not. So the first question Tom, is... Tom, Tom it's Joe. Yeah. Good question. So just as I read this, I actually don't know the answers to many of these questions. Like, will it impact public and private water supplies? How, what is it about us being the preservation board that has any expertise at all? You know, will it... That, that 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 this is they they expect that so from the application materials that you see do you see any uh potential in these different areas they're required to disclose information in part one to, to help boards and individuals make the decisions in part two so you're not under an obligation to be like a professional engineer and having gone out and tried to figure out whether there's, uh, uh, you know, stormwater impacts or these things. You, you have to just rely on your reading the application and having looked at part one. Is that sufficient, Carol? I, it, it, you're answering my question, Tom. I mean, it's it's. It's a fine answer. I just worry that we don't have the expertise as a board to answer some of these questions. I mean, I, I visited the site. I read part one. Um, trust, I don't know. Trust me, I don't, I don't even. I mean, just, just to look at the first question, I don't know what an adopted land use plan or the zoning regulations are. So, the land use plan is what is disclosed to you in the staff report. We're looking at the, the certificate of appropriateness and it tells you what they're doing and if they're code compliance on the second page, uh, that addresses the land use plan by whether it complies with the code. So let's just start and, and go through the questions. Um, number one, will the proposed action create a material conflict with adopted land use plan or zoning regulations? Is, is there any significant impact potential there? What do people think? I would say no based on part one. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. What? Sorry, I would say no based on part one. I didn't see anything in part yeah. one that really related to that. Right. Again, I'm not an expert, but that's what I that's what yeah. I read. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? All right, I'll take silence as a sense of there being no or small impact. And, and I, I should also mention that if determining that this doesn't, if you were to determine that this doesn't have the potential to have a significant adverse impact on the environment, that doesn't mean that you still can't reject this as just not fulfilling the standards of appropriateness. It's, it's not, you know, it's not predetermining your decision on the merits. It's just 
trying to identify whether there's any potential impact that would require a elaborate environmental impact statement to assess. So your next question number two, will the proposed action result in any change in the use or intensity of land? That one is an easy no, because they're replacing a tank with a tank. Yeah. I, I would agree. Yeah. Especially since they're replacing a tank that has outlived its usefulness. Nope. Uh, will the proposed action impair the character or qu quality of the existing community? Um, I'd say no, because they're, they're immediate, they, uh, since they impose the, uh, I can't speak tonight. Since they propose screening it, it would, uh, I don't think it'll have any impact. It won't be visible. And it's an industrial building as it is. I would agree. Agree. Uh, number four, does the proposed action have an impact on environmental characteristics that cause the establishment of a critical environmental area? Um, this isn't within a critical environmental area. So that one is just is no by, by law and mapping of uh, where we have our critical environmental areas. If it was within 100 feet of the riverbank, then it would, but it's not. Number five, will the proposed action result in an adverse change in the existing level of traffic or affect existing infrastructure for mass transit, biking, or walkway? No. No. Number six, will the proposed action cause an increase in the use of energy? and it fails to incorporate reasonably available energy conservation or renewable energy opportunities? No. No. Number seven, will the proposed action impact existing public water supplies or public wastewater treatment facilities? No, it's not connected to either of those. Number eight, will the proposed action impair the quality or character of important historic, archaeological, architectural, or aesthetic resources? Nope, not based on this in part one. Number nine, will the proposed action result in adverse change to natural resources such as wetlands, water bodies, groundwater, air quality, flora, or fauna? No. 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 All right. I'm going over to the next page. Number 10, will the proposed action result in the potential for erosion, flooding, or drainage problems? No. No. And number 11, will the proposed action create a hazard to environmental resources or human health? No. no. Only if it goes wrong. So, so what we have now is that, that this by law means we've, you've issued a a uh, negative declaration. And so at the bottom of the page, we would check um, the second box. And so what I'll we'll do is uh, check that. And uh, after the meeting, send it to, to Chris for his signature on your behalf. Okay. And thank you for your patience with this. I turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Tom Worth, for going through that. So that was the first time that I have gone through one of those as well with uh, the board, as you know, all know, because we've never gone through that together before. Uh, so that's something that more commonly the uh, Planning Commission does, because they get a lot more projects that fall under the unlisted category, which requires that review. Um, there, 
this, uh, I guess that's it. Um, so the, did anyone have any other questions about any of the cases or any outstanding, um, any, anything? I got a question. Yep. What's going on with the corner of Culver and East with the, uh, with the guy's fence that's in his, that he's hidden in the bushes? Um, that's currently an enforcement. Uh, that's still something that is recurringly an enforcement. I can follow up with uh, Rick Rivera on that just to see where we're at and get back to uh, board members. Um, but you know, once a project's in enforcement and we've ticketed, uh, it's um, you know, enforcement continues. It's not like we, uh, it's the city doesn't forget about something like that. It stays in our system. Um, one thing I'm now realizing is we didn't do site visitation. So, uh, if we want to go through each of the properties, and everyone wants to say if they, oh, you know what? Uh, or, oh, okay, yeah. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, case one, uh, South Goodman Street. Did everyone visit that site? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. If I don't hear from you, I guess, or, or if someone doesn't say no, then I will just assume that you've all visited it. Yeah, so, I've one. Got I've got a question on that one. When I went by there a couple of weeks ago, there was a for sale. And then last week, the for sale sign was gone. I'm just wondering if that has any bearing in the case. Um, I don't believe it would. Tom, can you confirm that? For sale sign for uh, for number one, the- The Divinity School. The Colgate property? Yeah. Really? It was only up a short time, I guess, and then it can't, it's down now. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't aware of it being under sale, but regardless of wh whether it is or not, they're still subject to all the uh, requirements of the law and everything they committed to when they um, got their approvals for the plan development district. But but that so you saw it and then it wasn't then you the second time you didn't see it. That's correct. Okay. okay. Did anyone else see a for sale sign there? I did not. No, I didn't. Yeah, I I saw the sign. It was up for a little while. I didn't I didn't see if it was for sale or if it was like for lease. If they were trying to lease out the buildings that erupted. No, it, it said for sale. Oh, yeah, it was there for a little while then then gone. Um, second case, 149 South Fitzhugh Street. Okay. Case three, 1100 Park Avenue. Case four, 240 Culver Road. Case five, 498 West Main Street. Mm -hmm. Case six, seven South Madison Park. Case seven, 48 King Street. Case eight, 232 Mill Street. Case nine, 729 to 733 Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. And case 10, 1475 East Avenue. So just to confirm, all board members visited all sites. Um, now, Karsten, I know that you weren't previously here for cases one through five. So um, I will state that unless you had visited the site, well, you, I did. Be part of this you did visit those sites. Um, Tom, how would I address that in hearing, just as a refresher? She's going to recuse herself anyways, so I suppose I'll just say all board members have visited the site. There may be no further clarification required, correct?
Tom Worth. Actually, this first one, if she visited the thing now, it's a better proposal than it was last month when it came in. So I'm not even sure she missed anything. Yeah. Tom, just, uh, just clarifying that you can hear me all right. Okay. Um, so I think- What was your question, Chris, about recusing herself if she hadn't listened to the recordings? Can you repeat it for me? Yeah, so um, Kirsten was not here for cases because she's a she's an alternate uh, who's filling in for Deborah tonight. Um, but she did not visit, or I'm sorry, she was not there for the hearings for cases one through five. So she's not going to be able to speak on them tonight since they are um, return cases. So my question is. Yeah, so you don't, she, she's refused. Can you hear me? This is Tom. I can hear you now. So Carson's recused. She can't participate in those matters, unfortunately, because we didn't yep. think of in advance to send her the tape of the prior meeting. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Carson. Yeah, no, that, the, the question was more of process wise. When she recuses herself, I'll state that all board members visited the site. She did visit the site, even though she has recused herself. So that was more of my question. What would be the best way to, to handle that in the hearing? To say that all, be, all members participating in this matter attended the site. Okay. The site. That's, a, that's a, a good way of saying it. Okay, thank you. Um, that concludes the pre-meeting if nobody has anything else. And we will reconvene at 6 p.m. for the public hearing. So if you just want to mute yourself, uh, mute your video, and then we'll reconvene at 6. Thanks, everyone. See you later. <laughs>